So I'm uh, very happy to uh, welcome Enzo Tagliacucci from University of Buenos Aires. I guess uh, there's not so much that I have to introduce him because most of you who are here will have heard of him and might have seen some of his work. So initially Enzo studied uh, physics actually and then uh, in, did in Germany uh, a PhD in neuroscience, was uh, working in Frankfurt, afterwards moving a lot around, working in the Netherlands, in Paris, and uh, now is back to his country of origin. Um, to uh, Argentina is working at the University of uh, Buenos Aires. Uh, he's famous for uh, work on altered states of consciousness in the broader sense, not only on psychedelics as such, was doing lots of work also on sleep research, uh, creating uh, very valuable uh, data sets there. And I don't have to list all of the grants that he received. Uh, so uh, it's my great honor and pleasure to have you Thank here. You. And so uh, we are very much looking forward uh, to your talk. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'm also very excited to be here. So, um, a bit of context. Mm -hmm. So, I'm 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 really um, impressed by by this cycle of talks. I think you have excellent speakers, and as I've seen you, feel you we are covering like basics uh, of of psychedelic science, from pharmacology to mechanisms in humans, uh, different approaches, but also patients. So, it's really very complete. And so, I'm going. To, what I'm going to to tell you a bit about today is a series of studies we published, but within the context of an idea. An idea, or maybe more than an idea, is like a problem or a question that is a bit open-ended, is that, okay, how exactly should we study the effects of psychedelics in humans? It's not obvious, right? So, um, uh, of course, first, I, I, I would like to convince you that it's not obvious, but then I'd like to propose some alternatives. So, um, so this will be basically, uh, a talk in which even though I will present results and so on, I think the objective is to think uh, beyond that about the methods and, and the methods uh, not in the sense of fMRI machines or issues, but more, more basic, more, you know, what is uh, the outcome of an experiment, what we should measure, uh, what uh, is useful to characterize the effects of psychedelics, and then when we combine it with all these machines, we can learn something about the brain, but it's even a bit more basic than that. I had a very long title, but you will see why I changed it to this short one, which is psychedelics and non-purposefulness. So of course I have a few slides first, where I, I, I try to convince the audience, in this case it won't be necessary, that studying psychedelics is an interesting problem. Even though, you know, today there are many reasons to study psychedelics from therapeutic perspectives and so on, if you think a bit about the effects of psychedelics, it's hard not to be interested in them. Um, this very, there are a few slides that I will, probably you, you are very aware well of this, so the idea is to introduce psychedelics, you know, as compounds that you find in nature that have a chemical structure that has a backbone that uh, is similar between them and also with serotonin. So this leads us to believe that serotonin is implicated in the effects of psychedelics, which indeed it is. As you know, the 2A receptor is key for the action of psychedelics and then you can find, for example, in the brain wh where you have the highest density of these receptors. And very interestingly, you use techniques to find this and you find uh, frontal parietal networks and regions implicated in perception, which leads us to believe that these drugs will have a profound impact in perception and consciousness, which they do, of course. The effects the, that, that, that are known uh, for psychedelics, these slides are, are the ones we use uh, when we speak about psychedelics in high school, so they are a bit colorful. So, you know, you have the, the distort, this is the most uh, salient effect, uh, the visual distortions, not, not uh, hallucinations, I'd say, but more like a distortion of what's being perceived, so this is obviously a cut, but a cut from the perspective of someone, and there are quite a high dose of psychedelics, so you see that there is a distortion distortions in the sense of time, so you know, this, uh, it feels like we've been here for three hours, it's like 20 minutes, typical. More abstract effects, like, you know, changes in, in how we perceive the boundaries of our body, uh, you know, this idea, this feeling that, that our bodies encompass more than what they usually do, this, this beautiful term for the, that, that's oceanic boundlessness. And then there are other things, of course, that are caused by psychedelics, you know, changes in mood, you can become euphoric, 
anxiety, uh, and then of course there are persistent changes. You know, first of all, why would we study them as potential treatments if they, you know, that they, they cannot induce persistent changes? We hope that these changes are good. Some of them, of course, are obviously good when you treat the patient and the patient becomes better, and some of them are neither good nor bad. Like for example, changes in personality. Of course, for some people those might be beneficial. For some people. Maybe not, so it depends, but it's good to know that this can happen. Then, of course, very briefly, also this is very important, essentially the context, you know, of the high school students who have been exposed to all these myths about psychedelics, uh, not the effects, which are not the effects of the classical. I emphasize classical here because, you know, I mean by this, like LSD, DMT, mescaline, psilocybin, these compounds, which are very safe. I don't mean to say that all psychedelics with all the varieties and synthetic compounds are very safe, which is not, not true, but the classical psychedelics are very safe. They don't cause addiction. They do not really lead to huge changes in, you know, blood uh, pressure or heart rhythms. You know, they don't, because of this, it's very difficult to find in the literature cases of overdosing. There is not a, it's not a delirium that is induced by psychedelics, it's more like a modification of perception in which the, the, the individual, and there are reasonable dose, of course, you could say, you know, but I have a cousin who had this huge ayahuasca trip and he believed that he was, okay, I'm saying, you know, like a typical dose, maybe if you overdo it, you'll find yourself more in a delirium state, but uh, like the typical doses you find in, in, the, in science. And then we know that even though at, at in the earlier days of psychedelics there was a, an implicit association between schizophrenia and psychosis uh, and, and psychedelics, today we know from very solid um, evidence that there is not really a reason to believe that psychedelics will cause uh, any of these diseases or conditions in someone who doesn't already have them. Uh, but then, uh, I think that that um, in recent years there has been even more interest in psychedelics and in more in other effects that are a bit even more abstract than these, but also more related and more important to the human condition. Uh, for example, effects that speak of uh, mystical or mystical type states, which is the term coined by the the Ron and Griffith groups in John Hopkins. Many of the aspects of the experience are typical of these, uh, these kind of states, like for example, this unity aspect, this feeling of being one with the rest of the universe, the feeling that is very difficult to do justice with words to what you're experiencing, this feeling of being beyond the present time and the present uh, location. Noetic aspect is this feeling that maybe even though what happens is strange, in the end, it feels more real than, than what the reality usually is. Of course, uh, these mystical type experiences, they are not anxious, they are not distressed, they are usually blissful, and people also report feeling part, uh, as feeling, you know, feeling part of something that's larger or more important than themselves, which for me, at least in my, according to my interpretation, is what they mean when they say that the experience is sacred. And the group of Rand Griffiths has established that these effects can be reproduced, captured by a questionnaire. This questionnaire shows also that there is a dose-dependent effect of the mystical type score. Um, and, and, and what I think is the most uh, embarrassing thing is that, you know, you, you take one of the persons that participated in this study and you ask, you know, how would you rate the experience you have in terms of importance compared to the other experience in your life? And many times you, the answer you get, you know, this is, the most important and one of the top three most important experiences I have ever had in my life. And then you wait for two, two, three years, you ask the same questions and you get a very similar answer. So psychedelics are drugs that can induce all these effects, but also if the conditions are adequate, can induce like everlasting, very memorable, very meaningful, pivotal experiences. Um, so, so, uh, if we start thinking, you know, we're going to have human subjects as participants, I will start to become a bit worried, right? Because it would be weird to have a participant in a study, you know, and as a byproduct induce uh, the most important experience of his or her life. But for example, as an example of something that is not very constrained, like we should simply ask you, can you please tell me what, how your experience was? And you simply start speaking, and this is 
extremely unconstrained because I'm not basically imposing any limits or any guidelines on what you have to say. So basically you have all the possible combinations here. So the typical constraint and objective sort of task. For the task you have to perform, there is an objective measure, that objective like, you know, measure, measuring the, the, I don't know, the rate of errors in a go, no go paradigm whatsoever. And this is of course something that you cannot fake, you know, this is not you talking about yourself, but it's more like an objective measurement. Then you have subjective but constrained, like questionnaires. I constrain what you want to say, but I ask you about your subjective experience. An example of the same, but not as constraints uh, that, you know, we can learn in an objective way about the effective effects of the drug. Here I put some, some examples, for example, maybe gaming or some behavior that is spontaneous or natural perception. So I will try to convince you that here maybe is where the challenge is. So, um, and, and, and I think that I, I use the word already a couple of times, which I don't really like it. If I, if I had to uh, sort of specify what maybe an adjective to, to, to characterize this part of this diagram, well, you'll find somewhere the word naturalistic, and this is very common, you know, we conduct a naturalistic experiment about the effects of psychedelics and so on. But I don't think that this would be weird because, you know, you're having these mystical type experiences that are not very, I would say, natural, naturalistic. Uh, they are actually, you know, strange in a way in frequency. Uh, the word ecological is also used, but I think also it's quite weird. So the one I, I like is non-purposeful. Non so these tasks are non-purposeful. So there is not a clear objective. So you behave because you like to behave in that way, and that's the way it goes. And we might be able to learn something about the effects of psychedelic, studying tasks which do not have a clear objective. So uh, in the words of the hippie philosopher Alan Watts, you know, uh, this who was described by, by Aldous Huxley, a half, half philosopher, half racetrack operator, um, he said, you know, that, that it's not like you, you play the piano to reach the end of the piece. You play the piano because you like when you play piano, or you don't dance to reach a particular part of the dance floor, you just dance because you like it. And, and the, the key point is what you are doing is because it is the doing of it itself that is important to you. So I think this is where we might want to be at some point with the kind of tasks we use with experiments. So I'm going to show you three examples now of studies we did to illustrate these ideas. The first one is a study we conducted about the uh, effects of microdosing with psychedelics. So there are, of course, many reasons to study the, 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 this phenomenon. The main reason, I think, is that it's becoming very fashionable, but there is not lots of evidence that people who get what they want to get from this. I mean, I'm not saying that, you know, there is nothing going on uh, when you microdose, but the real question is, if you microdose to become more creative, to uh, improve your well-being, to become more energetic, to improve your cognition and so on, are you getting that or not? And this is a good question, and I think that at the moment we published this, or we started thinking of this experiment, maybe today there are more studies, but at the time there were too many survey studies, which of course, in my opinion, is the worst way possible to study microdosing, because you simply go and ask someone who is already heavily invested in microdosing if there is an effect, there are sort of biases when you do that. So I think that there is basically a lack of good evidence in the literature about the effects of microdosing. What you need to do, of course, is to follow, you know, the standard double-blind, placebo-controlled design. And this is what we did. We tried to do this. Uh, we published this uh, last year. So this is basically what was the situation at the time. Um, I, I think it's okay. I mean, it's, it's reasonable that if you like microdosing, I mean, it's not that I'm above that. I've, I've, I've done microdosing myself. And, and of course, you know, uh, if you, at the time I filled the survey, you know, my answers could probably reflect that I'm doing excellent because I, you know, there's a reason why I started doing that. At least I'm not saying that I'm above the rest of the people. It's very common, this is, happens to everybody, you know, but science has ways to try to correct this. So this is what we want to do. Uh, so the experimental design, okay, so we, we ended up recruiting like 35 participants and basically there were two conditions, so half a, capsu so a capsule with half a gram, which is in the upper end of microdosing, it's almost like a bit too much. 
uh, of dried serosamine mushrooms, which we then we characterized chemically. We found the percentage equivalent of serosamine, all within the microdosing range. And the placebo capsule, this was randomized. And then the, either the, the active dose of placebo was taken for a, a week, like basically two days of the week, either the Wednesday or the, the Friday, they were, you know, for a week, the, the placebo week, you have placebo in these two days, and the active week, you have active dose in these two days. And across the week, we measured lots of things. You know, we measured during the dosing days, like lots of tasks, interviews, EG, and so on. But also in the off uh, dosing days, we have like actigraphy, vision analog scales, well, lots of things to actually try to understand what was going on. And then we analyzed the data. So one of the most interesting things about this is the acute effects. So basically, you have a visual analog scale, and you have all these items typical you know, questions about the intensity of the experience. And these are the dosing days, the Thursday and the Friday, and, and, and uh, sorry, the Wednesday and the Friday. And you have here, like for the unblinded group, this is the, the sub part of the subjects, the subgroup of the subjects who correctly identified that they were given the dose or the placebo. You see a strong effect during the dosing days. So there is actually a strong, you know, uh, uh, you know increase in the total uh, scales, those who are blinded basically fail to detect the condition, which is reasonable. So if there aren't any effects, people fail to decide, you know, this is the dose or this is the, the placebo. And what's interesting, I think, for this is that only 50% guess the condition, which I think is very interesting because if this, for, for a larger dose, for higher dose of psychedelics, this tends to be 100%. So, you know, if you're giving someone like, you know, a full dose of a psychedelic, this, this is very hard to blind. But here with microdosing, you are like in the threshold of, of the perceptual effects. So, you know, half of the people, which we don't know yet really why. So this is something we need to investigate, why some people felt the effects and others didn't. But uh, yeah, so this is something that happened. So for this study, basically, we focus on these two traditional ways of assessing, you know, the experience, questionnaires and tasks and, uh, we found basically no results in this study for, for the most part. So we have lots of questionnaires to measure things such as anxiety, uh, negative positive effect, absorption, well-being, well, several aspects of, of, of the several domains that microdosers would expect to be enhanced or changed were not, neither in the unblinded nor the blinded group. So in terms of these subjective reports, there were nothing. Then we have these creativity tasks, which are more like, you know, uh, not really a subjective report, but a task you perform. So you have basically diversion and conversion thinking. This diversion thinking is more like, you know, uh, how many solutions to a problem can you think? And this is open-ended. The typical is, for example, question is name all the uses you can think for a brick. Uh, I have an example. This is a real example from, from the experiment. The first is a paper. So nobody says a brick is useful to build stuff. That's the most interesting thing. The most uh, common answer is a paperweight. I don't know what happens, papers flying all over the place. A doorstop, a mock coffin at the barbecue funeral. So this person was, you know, to throw through a window, to use a weapon to hit my sister in the head with. So this, this, the last two are basically the same, right? So you, you wouldn't count like, you know, two different uh, uses because basically both are weaponizing the brick. So um, basically you can score uh, these in different domains, like how, how quickly you came up with the, uh, the uses, how original they were, how well you explained them, how repeat, repeated they were. And in either of uh, these domains, we found an increase in creativity as, as maybe you would believe uh, if, you, if you believe in the effects of microdosing. And then you, there is conversion thinking, which you have to come up with a missing term. This one is, uh, is not um, from the experiment because our experiment was in Spanish and this is in English. And there is a typo here, it has to say widow, no window. And if you have widow here, bite and monkey, the answer is a spider, right? Because you have the black widow, a spider bite, and then the monkey spider is not really a spider, it's a monkey, you know, these monkeys that jump around in the jungle. And then you have this one, I don't remember what this is, uh, sorry. And this is a bathroom, blood bath, bath salts. So bath is the one that's missing. No difference again. So uh, then we said, okay, you know, maybe uh, we find effects 
in the typical tasks that are used to characterize cognition and cognitive faculties. And we have lots of them. We have, for example, I'm not going to go into the details of each task, but for example, for attention, you have a task called attentional doing. So basically you measure the detection of a target after another target was appear very close in a sequence. And, and what you find is that this is corrected for multiple comparisons, the visibility of the second, of the second um, um, target over short, short, wind, short distances is compromised in the psilocybin condition. So basically you perform worse when you are under psilocybin condition than uh, when you are in the placebo. And this is a microdose of microdose of psilocybin. This isn't even a high dose. So the subjects aren't really, you know, uh, tripping that hard. Then you have the something to investigate inhibitory control called the go-no-go -no -go paradigm. Again, here there are no differences. You have the Stroop test, which is something to measure cognitive flexibility. You have, again, differences in the reaction time pointing towards lower reaction in the psilocybin. Uh, and then you have other tests, I guess it's a trial making test, no differences, uh, and so on. So basically the message here is that we have uh, different tasks that measure uh, different aspects of, of uh, cognitive function. And the only differences we found were towards decreased performance with the psilocybin microdose. So even a very small dose of microdosing can impair, at least seemingly based on the task, uh, cognitive function. And I think this all boils down to difficulty in attention. So again, if, if a person is not attending properly to a task, we cannot really expect a good performance. So, and very briefly, we found also in the EC some effects like kind of for a shadow, what is seen when you use, uh, you study much higher dose. So you have some reductions in spectral power in the theta band with eyes closed. What happens is when these doses increased, these, these reductions in spectral power tend to be more widespread and focused mostly on the, on the alpha band. And basically you have like a broadband reduction in spectral power. Um, so this basically confirms that we didn't find differences in complexity and also the topography of the EC was very similar. So the main message here is that we really couldn't find much evidence in favor of microdosing. We found some objective signatures in terms of the EC, but in terms of the tasks, to be honest, we found that the, the, the only differences were kind of in the opposite, what you would expect. But then we say, okay, you know, maybe the questionnaires are not useful because they were never designed to capture the effects of microdosing with psychedelics. And maybe that's the problem. You know, maybe we have these tools that were designed to capture, you know, mystical experiences, or maybe even, you know, the acute effects of much higher doses of psychedelics. And when you try to use them to measure, you know, to ask questions about someone who's having a very mild experience, these are not useful anymore because, you know, they are uh, not what they were meant for. So, so how we can solve that? Well, uh, we thought maybe what we need is something that is less constrained. And what we did is we analyzed natural language. And the idea is that we not only asked the participant to fill all these questionnaires, but we also conducted, conducted an interview and this interview is open-ended. So we have like different items uh, related to different domains, but it's not that they have to provide a rigid answer from one to 10, they simply go and explain themselves with as much detail as they want, what they felt, and how this was important to them. And interestingly, we found very robust differences when analyzing this data in this way, because then we have, here are the different aspect items of the interview, like, you know, a, a question related to feeling, a question related to expectation, perception, mood, creativity, and alertness. And for each of these questions, we have subjects elaborating. We basically get the transcripts of, the, of the, what the, the subjects are saying, and then we compute metrics uh, based on those transcripts. In this particular example, the metrics are very simple. We have, first of all, verbosity, which is simply how much they spoke, how many words they spoke, and this is systematically increased in placebo and, and psilocybin compared to the placebo for the microdose. So even, you know, the subjects are under a mild dose of microdose, of a uh, mild dose of psilocybin, sorry, when given the opportunity that we talked, you know, with more detail and, and explain themselves at like, greater lengths than when they, they received the placebo. And then we also measured the sentiment. The sentiment basically is, is a measure of positive emotion you use in your speech, and this can be done again using 
algorithms for natural language analysis, uh, we also found an increase in psilocybin. And both things combined allow like a machine learning classifier to very, to separate very well between groups. So what was failing in the questionnaires, we were successful, like taking a more or less constrained approach. So the interim conclusions about this study, I think that, you know, well, uh, there was uh, of course an effect of microdosing as seen in the bus with 50% blinding. Um, we don't know why, uh, but we didn't find much in terms of what we were expecting, like in the questionnaires and so on. However, when we analyzed the less constrained task, we found uh, quite interesting results. So, so I think that this opens the way to the next study, in which basically our objective was to take this a bit to an extreme. So the idea is, okay, you know, how much can we learn about psychedelics if we basically take more like, I would say almost like an anthropologist point of view, in which we are going to take the lab to where people are taking psychedelics as much as we can, measuring not only, uh, you know, uh, questionnaire scales, but also even brain signals, uh, but without any sort of intervention and trying to keep things as natural as possible, and allowing people to behave in the normal way they would behave. So what we learn, we can extrapolate directly to that context. Because as you know, when people take drugs, psychedelics, they don't do that in hospitals or research labs, they do it in a different context. So it's not certain how much what we know currently about psychedelics we can generalize to those settings, especially knowing that psychedelics are drugs that are so dependent on the set and setting. So we wanted, you know, to, to, to do this because of that. So this was published uh, also a couple of years ago in Psychopharmacology. The idea was as a motivation, well, you know, this doesn't go well together. So this idea of measuring task-based protocols with psychedelics, I think that as I said, you know, what happens is that the subjects, uh, they, 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 the attention is compromised, so the data is useless. But also, not only that, I think the subjects are not having a good time. So this is important as well. I mean, of course, on the one side, you want to get good data, right? And if you get good data, you can publish your paper, and then if you don't get good data, it sucks, right? Because so you did all these experiments, and it sucks for you. But maybe what's important also sucks for the participant for a different reason, right? But, you know, because they were sitting in front of the computer doing these things for, for one. And I, don't, I mean, it's, I've been subject in these kind of studies, not only my, mine, but also from others. And if you're really under high dose of psychedelics, you don't care. I mean, you have to be honest. So it's extremely difficult to be like under 100 micrograms of LSD and give a shit, sorry about the expression, but to be you know, about, uh, you know, pressing a button because something appear on the screen. Uh, you know, it's, it's difficult. I mean, because, because the world is around you and all these things are happening and you might be, you know, having the most meaningful experience of your life, you don't want to be pressing a button. So, you know, it's, it's reasonable. So this is why also I think one has to be careful. So the study basically is very simple. I published online this ad. You should never do this. You should never put your own phone num number in the ad because you get, like I got 1,000 WhatsApp messages the next day, we had to change my number. <laughs> we have like all these, of course, standard uh, inclusion, exclusion criteria, assessed with psychiatric interview, pre-assessment, and then we are interested in people who smoke DMT, which were plenty in Buenos Aires. I mean, it's a, a common practice in certain circles. And at the same time, we, we measured EC with a high-end mobile equipment, we recorded an interview and we did also post assessments. We ended up again with 35 participants. When I say natural setting, I mean the city, you know? So it's not like in like, you know, natives who are smoking DMT before, you know, 400 years ago. I mean, the technology you need to extract DMT from a plant is, is, is you know, it's not, was not, never available to the natives. You know, they have other ways like ayahuasca and so on. So this is something that, you know, is, uh, practice that comes directly from us Westerners. And, and this is, of course, why I think this is a proper natural setting. So this is uh, what it looks like, the MT free base. This is all the places in the city we went, you know, except the south because it may be a bit dangerous, you know. <laughs> Maybe people there are not, uh, smoking DMT is not the main priority. And this is a, a very nice example. I don't know if I can actually give play. No, it's, uh, okay. Well, the, the video is not working. It's a pity because it shows like the issue traces. Um, yeah, the, the issue recording over time 
at one of these uh, measurements. And what you see is you see the alpha rhythm, you know, all well, nice and synchronized. And then uh, the shaman, who is sitting in the first row, by the way, <laughs> does some, some like uh, flicking of the fingers the moment the person smokes at the end, exactly that sound. And then you see the Ishi changes completely, it becomes the synchronized, the alpha rhythm is gone, and you see it like, you know, real time. Doesn't matter, don't worry. It's probably because I copied to the, it's okay. It's just your Ishi traces. <laughs> but we'll have enough issues. Yeah, oh, there it is, there it is, huh? Yeah, it is. It's not. What you hear is the music. In this particular case, is uh, music in 12 parts by Philip Glass, which again, you know, people can choose their own music. Why not? It's not that. It was working, huh? It was, yeah. No, not anymore. <laughs> okay. But it's, uh, it's Philip Glass, so it's always the same thing all over again. Ah, don't worry, it's okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so then, you know, we took the interviews just as a super simple qualitative characterization. It's uh, very interesting. You have like two main topics in what people speak. You have one topic, which is basically about the space, the cosmos, the universe, the geometry, fractals. And then you have another topic, which is basically about love, humans, relationships, energy, connection. The acute effects of this, you can characterize like this in from this profile, this radar plot sort of. You have all the alter states of consciousness questionnaires with different dimensions. This is very typical, this peak here in the visual imagery. And then you have other peaks in mystical experience questionnaire, which is the, the questionnaire designed by the Roland Griffiths group. And, and you know, essentially this is very typical of, 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 of what you, you would expect for a drug like DMT, which is short lasting, very intense, very uh, affecting very strongly visual perception. So much visual perception that I think the uh, EEG results are very nice. So basically what you have here is the power spectrum for the, the three different conditions. So this is basically the frequency and the intensity of the oscillations. So you have eyes, eyes closed in, in this sort of orange color. And this is the extent what you see from what Hans Berger saw for the first time when we measured the EEG, very old stuff you have like a peak in the alpha rhythm, these oscillations close to 10 hertz. When you open your eyes, or you engage in some sort of uh, forceful cognitive processing, this peak is very attenuated, gone almost. And when you smoke DMT, even though your eyes are closed, the she looks almost as if your eyes were open. So it's difficult not to believe that this has to do with all the stuff that is going on in your visual perception, even with your eyes are open are closed, sorry. And we had one participant who put it very nicely that she said that, that the visual perception she was getting from, from the DMT was so strong and she felt that whenever she wanted to close her eyes, to stop seeing, she had to actually open her eyes, you know, like that because the, with the eyes open, she was getting less input than with her eyes closed. So the different oscillations that are changed are mostly in the, the, the delta rhythm. You have an increase also in the gamma oscillations and there is a decrease in alpha. This is well characterized. We were also able to measure like a progression of a long time of how, how these oscillations appear and, and disappear like a spatial temporal profile. So there is a gradual recovery of alpha from, from two back. But what I think is more informative for the context of this talk is that we then correlated some of the dimensions of the questionnaires with the EG oscillations. So what we found, the most strong effect we found was a change, so an, a correlation between a change in the gamma oscillation and the increase in this uh, mystical uh, um, subdimension of the ADSC questionnaire. And I think that this is very informative and very interesting because for, for two reasons, but you, you don't find this in the literature, or you find very inconsistent results in the literature about this, mainly because it's very difficult to measure gamma. Gamma is a fast oscillation that appears in the ishi, that whenever somebody is anxious and clenching his or her teeth, you get artifacts. So you have to be, either your subjects are relaxed, or you have to be very selective with your subjects. And in this particular study, we were able to do both things at the same time because we had so many participants and also they were relaxed in settings like their own home or house, whatever. Uh, we were able to get lots of good data and we found this correlation, which as, as far as I know, is one of the first like objective uh, signature of these sort of mystical states. It's interesting because studies of meditation, 
with very you know experimentation report the similar results i think this is interesting and maybe something new we learn because of the paradigm so uh, we observe these changes as seen during conclusion this is very consistent with previous studies but we also we are capable of measuring other things that maybe relate you know to the to the benefits of uh, going to a setting you know that is uh, more natural for the participants so i'm also close to finish because i don't think i have much time and and um, as i want to venture into the this diagram here so the idea is that we this is ongoing work how can we measure um, the effects of psychedelics not in terms of successive reports you know this is something that already show you results like you know nlp analysis of uh, interviews but also you know how can we obtain that data that relates you know to a behavior not to a report to a behavior to some something that the person is doing but that is not as constrained as a typical task so this is where i think one needs to get creative so uh, we designed very lots of different tasks and we studied them and the people under psilocybin but the one i want to tell you about is the one i like the most and the ones we, we have results and the idea is that uh, we want to study how people see so not when, not not what they report whether they like what they see or not or how it is changed but how actually they behave in the process of seeing so how their eyes fixate at different points in space when they are seeing something how this can be modified by psychedelics so the idea is that when you see an, something that's in front of you a painting whatsoever you have to explore it right you don't get everything at the same time and this this exploring is you know must have it probably has a certain procedure you go from the details to the whole or maybe the other way around maybe you focus on something and then go to other parts of the painting so the idea is maybe when psychedelics you know you're under the states induced by psychedelics the way you choose to explore or basically the way you explore a visual scene is different so for this what we did is we gathered lots of paintings like you know works of art from uh, a well-known database of paintings all through, throughout history so from the renaissance to or even before to, to modern art and we have trials in which we present for half a minute all these artworks and the person we ask them to say how much emotion it elicits and how beautiful they believe the painting is but this is not the important part. The important part is that when they are looking at the picture, we, are, we use a device called eye tracker to find where they fixate at different points. So this is just a sort of a sense, you know, a, a check um, that, that actually the drug behaves as expected. So basically what you have here is time. So one, two, three, four hours after the drug is taken by the participants. And what you have here is those in, in blue and orange is the placebo you have the scores of different items in the vision arrow scale and all they all are more significant in the dose and they all tend to have this inverted u profile in which they it peaks between two or three hours most of them and then it starts to go down and after four hours i would say that uh, the start the effects start to recede like the fifth hour the effects are almost gone so this is reasonable the experiment was conducted in the first part like between one and two hours um, of course because when we were measuring other things in the rest of the experiment so um, we we have a questionnaire here which is designed to measure aesthetic, aesthetic experience and this questionnaire basically tells us that the psilocybin is enhancing the emotional response to the paintings and also this feeling of flow of this effort effortful uh, perception you know that being engaged in the present moment looking at the pictures is also enhanced by the drug in terms of the fixations basically we came up with four different metrics that are roughly designed to capture how local or global the exploration is so you have first of all the number of fixations so the number of time the person fixated for a certain time the the, the gaze their eyes in the point of the painting then we have the distance between successive fixations we have the time spent this fixation we have the distance between all pairs of fixations and essentially we have differences in in the first in the second and the last so the idea what this tells us is that there are shorter fixations with psilocybin so people tend to make shorter shams and overall all of them are more concentrated because the, the distance between all, all of, of the pairs is lower so basically 
this tells us that people are more, more is, there is less global exploration. There is more focus on a particular part of the painting. This can also be quantified by computing the probability of finding fixations in different parts of the image throughout all the pictures combined, com combined and, and computing something called the entropy and how, how picky this distribution is is related to the entropy and the entropy is essentially, um, so you have here the cellulose having, so the entropy is lower with the, uh, with the cellulose having that we got placebo basically. So this tells you that you know this is more focused uh, with again with the psilocybin. So this all speaks to you know people being more engaged in the particular detail or aspects of the paintings. And of course, this is something we will keep uh, investigating. But I believe that these kind of measurements are useful because uh, it's something that the subjects produce as a byproduct of doing what they would like to do. Maybe anyways, you know, it's, it's subjects tend to be engaged in the tasks we we put in front of them. But these aren't tasks in the traditional sense. They are more like, you know, behaviors that they will uh, welcome doing. And this is the idea, you know, do uh, ask to the participants to do something that they will do anyway and try to measure something that is useful for us as scientists. So as an, again, as seen during conclusions, so um, we found these changes in the, in, the, in the perception of the paintings and you can distinguish between conditions by looking at how the fixation explore the visual scenes and this might be a bit contradictory because we expected to find like a more homogeneous exploration of the visual of the visual scene because there is less prior importance assigned to different parts of the painting after the drag. But again, the, the, the other reasons to believe that all results also make sense. Um, and the final, this is very short stuff that we have just finished doing or we're going to publish soon. Uh, we're analyzing. Are also following this kind of idea of taking the lab to to the field and to study things that the participants they do like naturally when they are under the effects of drugs we conducted a quite large study combining a form of compassion compassion meditation with uh, in psilocybin retreats with 100 participants all the combinations of high low dose of psilocybin and uh, this form of meditation and a sham meditation. We measure lots of things. All this data, by the way, all the data of the other studies as well is available to analyze online. So we only not have only questionnaires, but we have physiological recordings, EEGs, uh, epigenetics, interactions like, like recordings of interviews, but also group interactions. We have fMRI before and after all the participants. Uh, we have like Ishi, this is again a video of us measuring Ishi kind of in the middle of nowhere where, where people were, you know, uh, sitting, you know, or, or lying in the grass uh, in the acute effects of psilocybin. In this particular case, we did not measure during the experience, but we measured before and after a typical site where, where this Ishi cups drying hang from a tree. So basically, I think that overall, I don't know if I have already many, if I gave you many answers, but I think that I, I tried to raise a question and the question relates to, you know, the problems of studying psychedelics with the standard paradigms. Um, of course, they are challenging to investigate using the traditional methods. And I think that we should think of less constrained tasks and maybe non-purposeful tasks. And, and just to, to, to close the, the presentation, the message is that we should never forget that, you know, uh, these are people we're measuring and, and, and psychedelics are very powerful drugs. And we are scientists, so we, we naturally, we adopt an attitude in which basically we have a problem to solve, you know, and, and we, and of course we have all the motivations, like, you know, papers, tenure, grants, but you know, even if you keep it like pure, you have, we have to crack this problem, you know, we have to crack the problem a whole psychedelics elicit their effects in the brain. But none of the subjects, even if they're scientifically minded, the moment the drug kicks in, none of the subjects is going to see it this way. What they would like to do is leave, leave, what's, leave the experience. So this famous uh, quotation, quote by Kierkegaard, you know, that life is not something you need to solve, but something you need to experience, is actually 100% true for them. So we are like, there is a dissonance, you know, we want something and they want other thing. So there has to be a point in between, right? That's the way I see it. So, and, and I think the challenge is to explore that point and, and of course get useful results for us and 
and well, for the subjects, you know, uh, let them have their experience, which is after all the most important thing for them. So um, this is what I wanted to tell you, and thank you very much, Rebecca.